Okay, uh, dear followers of the Welt Morgen, that's the world tomorrow in English. Today we are receiving uh, Frank Barat, uh, a journalist that we uh, follow and admire for his work and his impressive network. He's a French citizen, but he works mainly in uh, Anglo-Saxon. He has worked mainly in Anglo-Saxon countries. Personally, I've heard about uh, Frank Barat already 12 years ago uh, with uh, this book here. Eh? Uh, with uh, uh, a, a book with Noam Chomsky, among others, and Ilan Pape, and then in 2015. This one, the all books that I still highly recommend, recommend, and also this one. He was the editor, and it, it's also a, a show of what an impressive network he has developed over the years. He also uh, co-wrote um, The Struggle Makes Us Human, but I only have that in ebook version, so I, I cannot show it to our audience. Anyway. Uh, Frank does much more than just uh, getting people together to write books about their ideas. He does some what we call at the World Modern some real journalism, looking for the things that are not fit to print, as the New York Times likes to say, or that are you know biased, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Frank, my first question to you is: uh, Where does your activism and journalism as activism, where does it come from? Where did it originate? Hey, first, uh, thanks a lot uh, for for having me on uh, on the, on the Verel. It's uh, it's great. Um, and also, when when you said like Gaza in crisis was twelve years ago, uh, it makes me feel it makes me feel quite old. Wow, well, twelve years it sounds sounds crazy. But um, uh, it, it's it's a tough question, really. Where where does my activism you know come comes from, or where actually does people activism? You know, com comes from. You know, I think it's uh, it's in a way it's it's life. You know, it's life. It's, it's the people you meet. It's the 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 country. I guess you visit the countries you visit. It's um, it's you know, you know the the experiences you have in a, in your day to day life. I guess um, I was you know I was born in a very working class family. My, my dad is a, is a blue collar, as, as we call them, a worker, you know, living at six in the morning, coming back at six in the evening, pretty much six days a week. Um, and, and my mom was like a, some, some kind of a PA, I guess, secretary, you know, um, I've got five, five, yeah, five brothers and sisters. So, you know, we, we were, we were taught at a very early age that, you know, uh, that the struggle will be endless, you know, that's actually Mm -hmm. something that tattooed here it's I, I read it in a john berger book you know the struggle will be endless you know the, the struggle to to become a, a better human being the struggle to help others the you know because the struggle can be i guess very local at, uh, very internal even and and then international so i think it's you know it stems from a very early age um but what in a way was the tipping point and i guess what radicalized me was my visit to Palestine in 2007 and, and again I'm going to quote somebody else like Arunda Tiroy the Indian scholar uh, said something one day she said once you've seen it you can't unsee it and that's exactly how I felt after Palestine I was like okay now there's no way back you know there's no so slowly sort of activism I guess became an integral part of my life so yeah about yeah, 15, 16 years ago, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, uh, if, if that can uh, give you some uh, some uh, some, uh, some support, uh, when you say 12 years ago, it makes me feel old well, uh, to me. I'm 69. 12 years ago is yesterday. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's all, it's all very relative. But uh, that rings a bell to me when I was a young uh, student at the St School of Agriculture here in Brussels. I was still, you know, uh, the guy who like, yeah, let's go to the kibbutz uh, that because that's the real leftist ideal. And then slowly, by getting the real information, he said, oh, there's something uh, really rotten here. And so my political awareness also developed uh, by experience and by having from, from a young age this idea of being critical. Does it, is that really what is going on? Let's check. Let's double check. Anyway, Frank, what you do and what, what, what by the way, to our uh, viewers, uh, some of them uh, are already reproduced on our site, but also check his, uh, Frank Barat's YouTube site for many. 
What you do mainly is bring people together for debates or uh, on typical issues. Uh, what people uh, underestimate, it's just not sitting here and recording. There's a lot of preparation, getting in touch with people. But mainly, uh, the work that you do has mainly to do with, uh, and you bring together, by the way, some some very, uh, this this network, I mean, Shomsky, Vijay Prashad, Yanis Varoufakis, uh, I mean, I'm forgetting Ken Loach, but people like Roger Waters. Uh, mainly, uh, how do you, because that's interesting to us also, how do you uh, get together your information and start working on let's do this or let's do that uh, panel or whatever? Yeah, f first about bringing people together. I think this is, I mean, personally, I think this is the only way we're going to change anything, right? Or change the world uh, for for something better and, and fairer. And I think that, um, you know, when I, when I, worked as a coordinator, and I think we might talk about this a bit later, of the Russell Tribunal in Palestine from 2007, 8 until 2014. That's what actually we tried to do, you know, because, for example, on Palestine, you have lawyers and jurists working on their legal thing. You've got artists working on their thing, and you've got activists working on their thing. And we thought we needed to put everybody in the same room together to work on common strategies. So uh, this idea of bringing people together started years ago, and uh, and and when and when COVID happened uh, and the proper lockdown, like two and a half years ago, two years ago now, uh, everybody was stuck at home. You know, everything was closed, and I thought, oh, actually, it could be an opportunity to bring people together, but now on on your screen, right, on Zoom. So that's where I started this. I hate to call it. A YouTube channel, but this thing on YouTube where, you know, I was trying to interview first people on COVID actually, because I wanted to know more about COVID. And I think in a way that's what um, any citizen, you know, should do, you know, if, if you, if there is something happening, if there's an issue, if there's a war, if there is a, a problem that you, you need to read about it. You need to be informed about it, you know, you, you before actually opening your, your mouth, right. Or, so that's what I've tried to do on COVID, interviewing doctors, physicians, and researchers to try to understand, you know, um, what this thing was, you know, and uh, and then it merged into something bigger because, in a way, COVID was um, was a window in what's wrong with the world, right? The rich get the masks and the vaccines, the poor are left to die, the old and the elders are left to die in their home, you know, in the homes and. So then I I I I, I thought hey, that that's that's quite interesting. So I started to interview more more people on YouTube and uh, and where do I get my information? Uh, mainly it's obviously on the web, uh, various websites and sources and uh, but uh, and I think again we, we're going to talk about this uh, because I I I do think that the mainstream press or the corporate media. Because, I mean, we should call it the corporate media. You know, it's not, you know, including what's supposed to be left-wing papers or left-leaning papers like, like The Guardian. You know, you've got to understand who owns the, these, these papers, right? To understand, you know, they've got a political agenda. I mean, no newspaper is, has got, they all have, a, you know, editorial line and editorial agenda. So uh, it's very hard nowadays, I guess, to get, proper information on on the mainstream press and that's actually a massive problem and that's why sources like the Verel, and sorry for my pronunciation pronunciation you know um are very important you know it's very hard to do i know loader it's very hard to actually get money and pay enough people and but it's crucial because we um we need the media is such a massive propaganda tool in a way you know i'm not trying to be conspiracy theorist here you know it's the truth uh, that if we don't as activists reclaim the media and try to invent a new media uh, it's going to be very hard to tell what's uh, the reality you know uh, because you have images of what's happening around the world that you see on your tv but the reality often is often very different so yeah well, uh, you actually uh, already answered the question that I was going to pose about uh, the mainstream media. 
but let's get to into a specific topic that is now really really urgent that's the war in ukraine you talked uh, already about uh, with uh, several of the people that i mentioned and others about their take on the war in ukraine and uh, the least you can say is that their vision on what's going on there is completely different could you uh, expand a bit on uh, the the things that you heard from those people on yeah and yeah, and again, I mean, Noam Chomsky spoke about this uh, in, in countless of interviews. Uh, John Mersheimer in the U.S., uh, but but also former, you know, secretaries of states in the U.S., former U.N. Uh, envoys. You know, I mean, the bottom line is the war is terrible. You know, war kills people, and uh, and what Putin did, even if it was if he was pushed to do it is a war of aggression and he shouldn't have done it. But you have to understand, you know, you have to understand an issue and understanding an issue obviously doesn't mean agreeing with Putin or agreeing with Zelensky is, you know, it's mean, you know, it's never really black and white and people want to say it's black and white. And the problem is when you say, hey, there's a little bit of gray here and let's talk about this gray, you get attacked. If it's Palestine, you an anti-Semite, as soon as you open your mouth criticizing Israel, and if it's Ukraine, you're a Putin lover or conspiracy theorist. And um, uh, and the fact is that information and understanding what's happening in Ukraine is crucial to end the war in Ukraine. What drives me mad is that you hear these people in the US, uh, com political commentators, member of Congress in France as well, that say, you know, we will stand with Ukraine, you know, until, you know, if, if, even if it's a fight to the death. But who are they? They're sitting in their, you know, in their nice living rooms in Paris and in Washington, D.C., and are arming Ukraine to the, to the teeth. But what's, you know, weapons kill people. They don't make the world a better place. So by arming Ukraine to the teeth, you make, you're making sure that more Ukrainians are going to die and more Russians are going to die and more civilians are going to die. And, and that's crazy. That's totally crazy. So the people that say, you know, the war should stop. And most of the time, war stops when people sit together at a table and negotiate. You know, Putin is not going to have 100% of what he wants. Zelensky is not going to have 100% of what he wants. The US is not going to have 100% of what it wants. NATO is not going to have 100%. But it, that's what's called a negotiation. You, you know, and, and we, we've heard you know, crazy, crazier things have happened. You know, the, the missile crisis in 62 in, uh, between the US and, you know, was avoided because people talked, you know, sworn enemies. And, but that's a language you can't have on mainstream media. You know, you either have the Ukrainian flag and support Ukraine to the death or, or you're a Putin lover. And by the way, I'm not an expert, but my opinion is you can arm Ukraine as much as you want the Ukrainian army will never defeat the, U the, the Russian army. You know, it's, there's no, the battle is not, you know, Russia is so much more powerful military, uh, militaristically than, than Ukraine. So it's, it's, a, it's a war to, to the death, but we don't want this, you know, we want peace. So, um, yeah. Well, I, I can say that our experience here, because uh, to our viewers, they already know I'm the old guy here. We all also have a very young colleagues who are very very enthusiastic about the work that they do but we have a, a very similar experience here on on the things with covid vaccines and now with ukraine that is you're either totally 100 percent with us or you're against us there's no yeah. in between and what i what i miss in the mainstream media there's two things that's context and history there's no context there's no history it just happens some mad guy in, in Moscow decided to go to war. There's nothing that happened before. There's no context of what is going on on the other side. And I think uh, the work that you do, Frank, and the work well that we try to do here is to, to give this other narrative. We're not claiming to be the, the right guys. We're, we're not saying we're telling the truth. We're saying, hey, listen, before you can judge, listen to both sides of the story. Uh, and I think that's something that you can get along with you too. Of course, and uh, and in a way, you can then might make up your mind once you know you you've heard both sides. And for example, on Israel Palestine, you know yep. you can listen to both sides, but at the end of the day, you realize that one side 
Israel has no argument. And, and, and you know, there's no argument. To, there's no, they can't have any argument for having, you know, killed kids and, and women and civilians for the last 70 years. There's no argument they can have to, you know, practice apartheid. So then you make up your mind and you realize the argument is, is, is so slim that, uh, that I think, you know, I should be pro-justice and pro-Palestinian. So it's like this on, on, on many, many issues. But again, we live in a world that is black and white. You either support, you're either with us or against us. Yes. You know, there's no, and, and it's, it's, it's very, it's very difficult because I think the most people work, you know, nine to five, get home, put on the TV, you know, and what they have is, is the mainstream media. You know, they, they're not going to, they don't have time. They don't have the energy. They don't have the resources to actually look somewhere else. And the mainstream media, and it's, again, it's not being a conspiracy theorist. We've seen this over and over and over. Takes the side of the powerful, takes the side of governments. Most of the time, look at the Iraq war, the BBC, for example, in England. Um, and so people, you know, make up their mind, but not in the right way. Um, and and that's, a, that's a terrible issue. And like Julian Assange, for example, is another incredible issue where people... Uh, first, hardly know about what's happening to him, uh, hardly know about how he's been treated for the last, I don't know how many years, um, hardly know, you know, what he's done and what WikiLeaks has done, you know. Uh, and, and that's another very important issue, you know, freedom of the press, in a way, freedom of dissent. Uh, but, anyway, uh, uh, Frank, there's so much more to, to talk about. In, uh, we're very glad that we have been able to introduce you to our to our audience, and uh, there's so much more to come. Uh, I can already announce to our uh, to our uh, listeners, to our followers, that there will be a sh a shortly coming uh, a, 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 com a, a debate by with Frank uh, with Vijay Prashad, and that he also has a, an in a, a very interesting interview with uh, Sean Kuti, uh, the the son of Fela Kuti, about the role of music and musicians in the political struggle. Frank, thanks a lot for uh, this uh, kind cooperation. And thank you, followers of the World Morgen. Don't forget to support us and push uh, the button on the on the right side. Sorry, on the right up on the right side. Frank's goodbye. Uh, thanks a lot, Lode. Bye bye.